Okay, well, w welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's get started. I'd like to introduce Grant Harris, who's the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Industry and Analysis. Uh, Grant was appointed by President Biden, confirmed by the U.S. Senate on April 7, 2022, and officially sworn in in April of 2022. Harris leads a staff of more than 225 trade and industry experts that produce innovative, high-quality, in-depth trade analyses and develop strategies to maintain the leading competitive edge of, of American industry throughout the world. Grant Harris. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here today and this important work that the committee is undertaking. And we're very much looking forward to the recommendations that it will produce. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes introducing myself and giving some examples of why this work is so important. So as was said, I'm the Assistant Secretary for Industry and Analysis, and this unit, which sits within the International Trade Administration here at Commerce, has the honor of administering this committee. And as was also said, and as the very straightforward industry and analysis name implies, includes <clears throat> a lot of the sectoral analysis or sectoral depth and completes industry analysis that underpins a lot of the supply chain work that the department is engaged in. I'm very honored to be with you today and in a few moments to be able to introduce Deputy Secretary Graves. Like me, Secretary Raimondo and Deputy Secretary Graves are thrilled to meet with you and hear what your thinking is and what your inputs are and what your recommendations are. And I hope that all of you can see how greatly the department values this work with the participation of the two of them, with Director Brian Deese and with an incredibly uh, mixed in, and substantial and diverse participation across the departments and agencies sitting in on today's meeting and working with you throughout. I understand that you're considering a variety of recommendations from the subcommittees on major competitiveness related topics from supply chain resilience and congestion to trade and competitiveness, freight movement and policy, trade innovation, regulatory issues, finance and infrastructure, workforce development, it runs the gamut of the many important issues that need to be addressed. I understand you're also looking at recommendations on promoting and facilitating end-to-end -end supply chain data sharing and visibility. We're looking forward to receiving all of these recommendations. This input is critical as we and the administration work to create grit resilient and globally competitive supply chains. I wanted to reflect on that just with a few examples of how valuable this stakeholder input is and how it proves to be important time and time again. To name but a few examples, the White House Port and Supply Chain Envoy, first John Porcari and now General Stephen Lines, continues to meet regularly with stakeholders from across the supply chain in identifying actions like moving to 24-hour, seven-day port terminal operations. Secretary Raimondo co-leads President Biden's Supply Chain's Disruptions Task Force, which works with partner agencies and stakeholders and taking in that input to figure out what additional steps can be taken to increase resiliency. At the Commerce Department, we've been a very active participant in the many interagency reviews required by President Biden's executive order on America's supply chains. And in identifying targeted solutions throughout, we've been consulting with a diverse group of stakeholders and benefiting from what they are seeing, what they are hearing, what they are recommending. Those orders, that order, excuse me, as you know, launched comprehensive reviews of supply chains ranging from semiconductors, critical minerals and materials, advanced batteries, pharmaceuticals and other key ingredients. And then a year later on that anniversary in February of earlier this year, there were additional reports on transportation, public health and biological preparedness, energy, information, communications, technology, defense, agriculture and food production, the many issues that we're working on and the many issues from which we're benefiting from your continued input. In each of these reports, stakeholder input has been vital to make sure that we're understanding the issues and the challenges and can develop action plans that are sensible and pragmatic and will make progress in these areas. So this team that I oversee at Industry and Analysis, along with the colleagues throughout the Commerce Department, have been not only deeply engaged in the reports, but deeply engaged in working with you and working with stakeholders. And I wanted to highlight our appreciation in that regard. We understand that this is an important form of public service. We understand the time and commitment 
that you are investing into this committee and into working with us. And we value that and appreciate all of these contributions that you are making. So the bottom line is we are looking forward to and greatly value and appreciate your recommendations. With that in mind, I'm really honored to be able to introduce Deputy Secretary Don Graves, who will be speaking for a few minutes and then we'll be introducing the Secretary and Director Brian Deese. Again, a testament to the importance of this committee and to the excitement on our part of hearing from you and understanding these recommendations. So thank you so much for having me. And Deputy Secretary Graves, I'd like to give you the floor. Well, thanks so much, Grant. Uh, it is great to see uh, all of you to, uh, today. Good to be with you. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your recommendations. Uh, it's especially good to see some uh, old friends. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Welcome to the second meeting of the newly reconstructed Advisory Committee on Supply Chain Competitiveness. Uh, and as Grant said, strengthening our supply chains, as you know, remains a top priority for the entire administration. Certainly it, that's the case for the president. Uh, and that's also uh, the case for those of us at the Department of Commerce. From our international engagement, engagements, excuse me, like the agreements that we reached uh, with the EU, the UK, Japan on the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs, and also the new Indo-Pacific economic framework uh, for prosperity. I always have to remember to add that in. To the work that we're doing domestically uh, around infrastructure and manufacturing, the, the Commerce Department is focused on securing and in improving the supply chains, the, the challenges that we're facing all across the country right now. But we know there's a whole lot more that we can do to secure the supply chains, our partners and our allies, uh, importantly, are devoting a huge amount of resources to analyzing, supporting the commercial industrial base, much more so than, than we do as a nation. Uh, just as an example, Japan employs about uh, 10 or so people in their analysis for, uh, for semiconductors alone, just 10 people that are focusing just on semiconductors. Here in the US with a much bigger economy, uh, and a fairly large department. We only have two people here at Commerce that are actually analyzing semiconductor supply chains. So there's a bit of a, of, a, of a mismatch, unfortunately. And our competitors, our trading partners, they're supporting their own industries, as we know, uh, unfortunately, to the detriment of, of our workers a lot of the time. On the investment side, Japan has a loan portfolio of $155 billion. Germany provides loans and grants upwards of $90 billion, and the UK uh, expects their program to grow to $2.7 billion. So that's why the Secretary and I are working with Congress every single day to get the Bipartisan Innovation Act across the finish line. I know many of you have been very much engaged uh, in helping us uh, on, on that as well. It's going to allow the US to make the critical investments, the time-sensitive investments that we need to proactively identify and address the vulnerabilities that we face in uh, these critical supply chains. And we think that it's going to supercharge our domestic semiconductor industry. We've already seen tens of billions of dollars of commitments, but we expect that those will grow uh, by multiples if we're able to get the Bipartisan Innovation Act across the finish line. We also need your insights, your recommendations to help inform our decision-making. So this committee's work is absolutely more valuable than ever. I know that the secretary and I are both very eager to hear your recommendations to address all of these challenges uh, and also any other uh, ideas, suggestions you have. Uh, thank you again for your willingness to serve on this committee, for your commitment, uh, you know, not only to the American people, but specifically to securing our competitiveness and frankly, our prosperity for the future. So with all of that throat clearing done, um, let me also move to, uh, to the next two speakers. It's an absolute honor to, uh, to introduce both of them who are both good friends and leaders. Up first is, uh, is Secretary Raimondo. Um, uh, at, she's the leader of our entire department. Uh, and frankly, uh, I think that uh, the, the Department of Commerce is 
um, moving at a pace uh, that hasn't been seen perhaps ever. She's focused on spurring good paying jobs, empowering entrepreneurs to innovate and grow, to help American workers, to help American businesses compete. And you, know, you all know her and her track record, so I'm not gonna talk about what she's done in the past. It's what she's doing now and what she's going to be doing going forward that I think are, uh, are really critical to everything that we're doing. So it's an absolute honor to be her partner and her friend. We're also joined uh, by another speaker, uh, another dear friend of mine and someone I've worked with for many, many years, that's Brian Deese. Uh, in both the Obama administration and now the Biden administration, Director Deese has, had, uh, uh, has helped us develop presidential budgets. He's focused on promoting economic growth and fostering opportunity for, for uh, all working families across this country. He's delivered this in a way that focuses on being smarter, more innovative, more accountable uh, 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 at the government level, but making sure that there's accountability throughout government. Um, his leadership on the National Economic Council has been absolutely invaluable to the work that we've been doing at the Commerce Department as we all work to implement the, the president's economic uh, objectives. And I'm so thrilled that he's joining us today. So without further ado, let me introduce our next speaker, Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. Thank you, Don. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing on this committee. I've had the opportunity to check in with a number of you uh, over the past couple of months, and you're doing fantastic work, really high quality work, and we're anxious to hear about it. Uh, so thank you to all of you. A, a special thank you to the co-chairs, Ursula and Jeff, for your leadership. I know this is a heavy lift and a lot of time, and I very much appreciate it. And the subcommittee chairs, Ravithi and Jean, and how, uh, thank you guys. You're all so busy. It's a hard time to run a company and you've made time to do this and I'm grateful. And I know Brian is grateful. Um, so I think many of us had hoped that by this point, we would be beyond the supply chain challenges and congestion challenges. Uh, but we're not, you know, we still aren't in some ways we're making quite a bit of progress, but in other ways there's, you know, still a lot more work to do. So uh, that's, it's these challenges <clears throat> that are the focus of, um, you know, of your work and of the administration's supply chain disruptions task force, uh, which the president created and which I co-lead. My partner in all of this work is the fabulous Brian Deese a man of unlimited energy, passion, and ideas. And I'm going to turn it over to him in a few minutes. But, but really, he and I are so grateful for your input. And at this point, there's nothing we aren't willing to try. Any good ideas that we have from industry, we're wide open to. Because the reality is there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing to solve our supply chain challenges. Um, it's The approach we're taking is, industry by industry, you know, where are the bottlenecks and bottlenecks and what can we do to alleviate them? And then with respect to logistics, you know, again, it's, it's uh, mode of transportation by mode of transportation. What are the issues? What are the bottlenecks? What are the crunch points in terms of pricing? And we're trying to be very thoughtful um, as we attack each of these issues. The other thing that we are doing, um, you know, with great uh, focus is urging Congress to pass the Bipartisan Innovation Act. I have talked to many of you about this. It will give the Commerce Department the tools that we need uh, to properly address our fragile supply chains. It will create a supply chain office in the Department of Commerce, as the Deputy Secretary just said, the United States is unusual and that we don't have a place in the federal government uh, that's properly resourced and staffed in order to measure and monitor our supply chains. It also very critically will send to the Department of Commerce $52 billion to stimulate domestic um, semiconductor production. I cannot say how vitally important it is for Congress to act right now, right now. Um, and the reason for that is because, uh, and many of you know this, you're in this business, semiconductor companies 
all over the world are making decisions in the next 30, 60, 90 days about where they will expand because they have to, in order to meet the demand in 2025 and 2026, they have to have cement in the ground on new facilities this year. South Korea, Japan, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, are, Singapore are all right now offering big incentives and subsidies to those companies to set up shop in their countries. And so I'm, I'm urging Congress, Brian is, the Deputy Secretary is every day for them to do the right thing and pass this before they head out for their August recess. Finally, I want to note that our work um, with our allies around the world continues. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that Secretary Blinken and I, uh, in July, will be hosting a supply chain ministerial to build on the supply chain summit that the president held in Rome last October, and of course, to build on the ideas that you're uh, bringing forward to us. The summit will focus on um, stakeholder engagement in the public sector and private sector uh, uh, in Europe and throughout the world. We can't solve this alone. You know, we're also launched, we've just launched the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. We need to work with our partners in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, throughout Europe in order so that we together can ensure resilient, diverse, secure supply chains. Um, and the work you're doing is um, central to all of these efforts. So can't thank you enough for your time and commitment. I'm excited to receive your recommendations and I'd like to turn it over to Director Brian Deese. Um, maybe Brian's not here. Grant, can you hear me? Can, I know that Director Deese was having an issue with video and was gonna join on audio. All right, well, let's, um, let's get into the Q&A and then shoot him a text and if, you know. We'll do, when he's he not signed in yet, okay. Yeah, when he arrives, we can um, <coughs> have him introduce himself. Okay, so I guess I, I'll start with the Q&A um, and I'm going to begin um, by posing a question to Doug Siva of Prologis. Um, and I see Doug is up there. So your clients are American businesses that like every American business rely heavily on data and sophisticated analytics to optimize their supply chains and their business operations. I'm curious what your individual observations are about how your companies are leveraging these tools effectively in their supply chain operations. And um, to what extent are they using the tools and analytics to do what I would call stress testing of their supply chains to identify um, and predict vulnerabilities? Uh, okay, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I would say from our perspective, being a landlord and developer, um, we're basically looking at this whole supply chain data issue as what we can do um, in our buildings, putting in sensors or being smart buildings, smart yards that we can help provide our customers. So our customers are really the ones that are in the supply chain that are living this and breathing it every day. Um, so when I look at what can be done, um, I look at a company like ours, we're trying to produce as much data in, uh, that's actionable, right? We can collect data. I think the industry has a lot of data, but we have to make it actionable. And the more we can define um, uh, to be, be proactive, not reactive, because right now the supply chain, when it breaks, we're reacting and then we fix it and we get something. But we push the basketball further up the garden hose. So what I think is really needed is this aggregation that we talked about earlier of all the data from the different portions of the supply chain. However, I would also say we should approach with caution. We should not try and bite the whole elephant off at once. We should start small and prove what we can do and what we can provide and then grow from there. So I, I don't know if I'm really answering that question, but um, I don't, he's happy to re, um, reply if need, more needed. Do you think, I mean, are you seeing your clients using your tools 
differently now as they um, evaluate their supply chains? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is a lot more, we're seeing a lot more interest in data. Before it was moving, it was moving product, right? We got to get it out. We, where's our next bottleneck? Let's move it. Let's get it to the next, to the next uh, stop in the supply chain, right? Whether it's the warehouse, it's the trade provider, it's the rail, wherever it may be. But I think what we're seeing now is a lot more interest in, in, the, in the data that we can provide, whether it's us or anybody in the supply chain. So how can we be more efficient? How we have we don't have enough assets based on the bottlenecks, right? To 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 uh, handle the volume that we have, right? So I everyone's realizing data is the critical point to identifying those bottlenecks early. If we can identify them early, we can uh, use our assets a lot more efficiently, which I think we're definitely going to need to do. In, in this. So we are seeing a lot more interest from our underlying customers, our tenants, our customers on what we can collect. So we're putting in systems at the gate, we're putting in smart buildings, we're doing that. So we would be one portion of the supply chain that we can add the data to. But yes, the answer is a lot more interest in data. We used to go to uh, conferences, supply chain conferences, and they were all about transportation. Now, all of them are technology driven. <laughs> You see everybody that's attending the conference or, or um, uh, having booths at the conference is all technology driven. Madam and Secretary. when you're talking about, um, you said aggregation of the data, what's the role for the government in that? I, I, think, it, I think it's to provide a, the resources and the, um, the platform to aggregate the data that people feel that it's safe so that it's anonymous. They're not giving up their proprietary information. So if you can keep it anonymous, and then we can also um, ensure that there's cybersecurity is becoming a lot bigger issue to everybody now on everybody, tip everybody's tongue. It has to be protected and anonymous. But if we can use that to then, as we talked about earlier, identify nodes in the supply chain where we're having congestions, we can be proactive. Madam Secretary, I'm yes. told that Director Deese is on. I think the technical issue is fixed. If you're there, Director Deese. Brian? Can you all hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Even after all this time, the double mute caught us. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and um, I just want to, um, number one, echo the thanks that uh, the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary uh, offered to all of you, particularly the co-chairs, for your service. Uh, number two, underscore my appreciation and partnership for both uh, you, Gina, and you, Don, and uh, the extraordinary leadership that and creativity uh, that you are driving out of the Commerce Department on behalf of the administration uh, and 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 helping in leadership for all of our agencies. Um, I'm I'm loath to speak too long because we're starting to get into some of the um, great detail uh, that I have um, I've been on and want to get to. I, I just want to take one minute to put the issues that uh, that Secretary Armando raised in a somewhat bigger context. I just I don't think that I that it that it could be a more important or impactful time for this committee to be doing the inquiry and the recommendations and the uh, and the public private collaboration that we're doing, because in addition to everything that the secretary raised, um, I, I just want to underscore our commitment, the president's commitment, the entire administration's commitment to actually implement a deliberate industrial strategy in this country. Um, and that's what we are talking about. That's what animates and ties together so many of the different planks that we're talking about. And that's what I think energizes the kind of uh, bold spirit of experimentation that Secretary Raimondo, you raised and that I think the recommendations that come from this com committee will uh, animate, but we really are in a position where um, in terms of deliberate public investment, we are doing things that we haven't done in decades. Uh, that is about the bipartisan infrastructure law. It is about what we're gonna do on everything from broadband to our physical infrastructure, but it's also about finishing the task um, and getting those investments that the secretary raised around semiconductors and around actual supply chain planning in a deliberate, serious way that is consistent with the challenges that we face. Um, we are not waiting on that, um, and we are prepared to 
continue to innovate um, as we um, as we face these challenges. The issue was that was just being discussed around how we actually build interoperable systems for data and analytics, where we have the combination of the trust and the capability. I think is at um, at the core of it, um, and also is a I would just say uh, what I would argue is an unapologetic um, willingness on our part to signal that we are going to try to build this capability and build resilience in our supply chains, but resilience in our industrial base in key areas like clean energy, that we intend to lead the world uh, in those areas. And I think that's important to send a policy signal uh, in, uh, uh, in, in those areas, uh, and that we intend to do everything we can to make to re-underwrite the competitive spirit of our economy, make our economy more competitive, create more opportunities for small, uh, fast-growing businesses, non-incumbents to disrupt and, uh, and do what uh, uh, they have so well in our economy, which is create the dynamism that separates the United States from other uh, countries. But at the core of all of those things is making sure that we build resilience uh, and and capability across our supply chains, I, you know, literally, uh, you know, in every one of those areas, when we are working through the policy issues, the degree to which we have fortified our supply chains uh, is is front and center uh, in both very immediate day to day issues. And I know, you know, uh, Gene and others uh, are are sick uh, sick of us, and, and hopefully the best way in terms of the partnership working on ports and rail and physical transport. Uh, but also in you know in ways that we haven't uh, we haven't yet imagined uh, or identified. So um, you know at the end of the day, this is why we're we're here. We are we're committed to an industrial strategy. We're committed to tying it back to what animates the president, which is this notion of rebuilding the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, putting working families uh, at the core uh, of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and so I, I just incredibly great, grateful to all of you for your time, your ideas, your partnership. Um, and with that, I will, um, uh, Gina, if it's okay, maybe I'll, I'll pose, a, I'll pose a, a second question here. We can sort of tag team. Does that work? Perfect. Thank you. Um, great. I, I was hoping to bring Willie, you into the conversation um, and, uh, um, and, and just raise this question of, where and in what context do you see the opportunity for reshoring, manufacturing, and how we should think about that as intersecting with the strengthening of our supply chains, uh, particularly in those areas where we have lost ground to China um, and other competitors, but principally China, um, and in those areas where um, we need to, uh, you know, we, we, we need to we need to run fast as a result. Uh, okay, well, thanks for the question. Let, let me answer that in three parts. I think first, in some of the proposals you're going to hear coming up, uh, uh, we talk about significant new process innovations, new ways of making, for example, fine chemicals and pharmaceuticals or critical minerals and metals, the things that the president's 100-day report highlighted where we have a heavy dependence on China and other foreign sources that make the supply vulnerable, okay? And the way I think about it is every time there's a major new process innovation, you just have to look at history on this, a new way of manufacturing or doing the processing, that is an opportunity to change the game, to seize the initiative from the incumbents who then become burdened with existing production facilities that may be fully depreciated, yet they don't want to throw them away yet, right? So in some ways, it's uh, a way of making existing ways of manufacturing things obsolete. Now. In this area, I think we are crazy if we miss this opportunity to grab the initiative back and bring good jobs back to our shores. Okay, so that's the first piece. I think another thing we're seeing is a lot of technology shifts like, uh, you know, in particular using digital design technologies with additive manufacturing, for example, for tool making in particular, which could help a lot of the SMEs in our country. If we leverage programs like the AM Forward that program that was announced uh, back in May to help train and, uh, you know, give demand signals as well. So, you know, we as a country lead the world in those digital design tools, right? So to the extent that we merge that with some of these production technologies and tool making and things, I think that plays to our strength. I think the third area 
you know, and one of our subcommittee members raised this in particular is we need to invest, uh, you know, where we're strong, particularly manufacturing for the life sciences. So this is everything from synthetic and industrial biology to new therapeutic technologies and stuff like that. We're the leader in science here. We have good capabilities. There will be a lot of good jobs in the future. So let's not let this one slip through our fingers. Overall, though, in response to your question, uh, I've been working for 43 years now, and I see this as the best chance in a generation to recapture some of that production for our countries. That's a shame. That's a strong statement. So shame on us if we don't capture it and make it happen. Um, okay, let's move this along here. I would like to bring in Indra, uh, who I've known for a long time. Thank you, Indra, for serving in this capacity. So uh, as everybody knows or may know, Indra brings decades of uh, experience in consumer products to this group. And obviously the companies um, you work with today and have worked with have relied on healthy infrastructure and logistics enterprise. So I'm just would invite you to share your insight about the state of the supply chain operations and the trends that you see. Thank you, Gina. And I think um, as opposed to what Willie talked about, which is all more technology oriented uh, solutions, consumer products is much simpler. And I think there are three big issues that consumer products companies are facing. The first is availability of labor, pretty much in every area, whether it's factory workers, truck, truckers, big shortage, and then skilled jobs. And you recruit people in and they get recruited out by somebody else for a higher wage. So the whole labor issue is really, really uh, a difficult one. In a way, I'd say the fact that we have such low unemployment is what is providing a, a, a good floor for us for inflation not to get any more worse than it is today. But the labor issue is extremely, extremely tight. And in consumer products, which are very labor intensive because of the distribution infrastructure, it's a big issue. And the cost of labor is creeping up. The second part of the PL that's really under pressure is fuel costs, both for the distribution system, but also the input costs, you know, fertilizers and things like that are impacting agriculture. And that's impacting the raw material costs. So the combination of these two is causing a big squeeze in the uh, uh, PNL of all the companies. And this is where you're seeing the pricing on the shelf go up quite a bit because all consumer companies are thinking through how to keep some growth going, how to uh, you know, impact productivity programs, reduce costs, but to uh, deliver some, something to the capital markets. So you're seeing pricing going up to the consumer and that's causing more inflation. So these two are creating big issues. Now, in the past, when we've had these sort of squeeze plays, we've relied on international growth to make up the difference and said, you know, we use international growth, like the 2008 financial crisis. We used international growth to fill the gaps in North American shortfalls. But this is the first time that's not possible either because uh, there is geopolitical unease in the minds of all CEOs. What's going to happen? Uh, you know, Russia was the first domino to fall. What else could happen? Where else could there be issues? And so I think going for global growth in a big way is not a solution. Uh, but if we can address the labor issue to start with in some shape or form, whether it's uh, figuring out how to bring the few, I think there's about 6 million workers who are sitting on the sidelines because they don't have care infrastructure to support them or the jobs are not where they need it to be and they don't have mobility. If we can somehow bring them back to the workforce, especially women, would alleviate the situation a lot. I hate to use the dreaded I word, immigration. It's got to be addressed at some point because we don't have enough workers. And then, of course, whenever the fuel costs can be addressed, whether it's through uh, increased drilling or uh, increased imports, we need this to be addressed. These are the two big squeeze points for all consumer companies today. Yeah, thank you. We're about a million eight uh, workers short of where we were pre-pandemic. Um, I will say I'm of the view that there's an opportunity now because of this unprecedentedly tight labor market that America really could start to make headway on apprenticeship initiatives and different sorts of job training initiatives 
in a way that we haven't, you know, for various reasons, including cultural. Um, but the labor market shortage and tightness is real. And as you said, Indra, there are people who are on the sidelines for lack of skill. Yep. And these people are not going to go back to college, you know, mid-career. And by the way, they need to earn while they learn, particularly yep. women who are trying to take care of their kids. So I think that um, we have to do a number of different things, but really rethinking the way we do mid-career um, training and hiring and apprenticeships, if not now, when? I think it's just absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Back over to you, Grant. Great. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary and Director Deese. I, I know that the agenda is packed for the advisory committee. And so um, in, unless there are any closing remarks or additional points, I would be inclined to turn it back over to Jeff and, and have them continue their work so that they can get you these recommendations. Okay, that sounds great. Jeff, handing this back over to you and thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Grant. And thank you, Secretary Raimondo and Director Deese uh, for your participation and support. We're grateful for your thoughtful framing of these issues that are of paramount importance to our nation um, and grateful for the support that you've uh, given to us and will give to us and the recommendations uh, going forward.